All right, what's up? Welcome in GC Live Monday episode of the show. Wes Mitchell, Chris Clark. Plenty to get to, but first, going to tell you about Clint Hammond and our friends, mortgageclinthammond.com. 803 771 6933 is the number. If you're in the market for a new home, give Clint a call. Or maybe if you're renting, wanting to kind of make that plunge and just wondering, hey, how does this work? I'm a first time home buyer. How much home can I afford? How much down payment do I need? What would a monthly payment look like? All those questions you may have can walk you through that process. Help make it simple. Help make it easy. And I'll probably talk a little bit of South Carolina sports with you while you're at it. Again, ClintonHammond.com for more information. Call his office at 803-771-6933. Plenty going on in the world of Gamecock sports. Another successful weekend for South Carolina on both the men's side and side. Junior day for football taking place this past Saturday. And um, Chris, all of it got kicked off on Saturday with the news breaking via NFL Network that South Carolina is expected to hire NFL veteran special teams coach Joe DeCamillis, a, a name that we had mentioned to our subscribers, one that we were tracking, one that we were trying to uh, you know, get some final confirmation on when that breaking news came on Saturday morning. We did confirm it a little bit later on. And uh, once the hire is official, I, I don't I don't know a resume standpoint if you're Shane Beamer, if you could have found a much better resume than what it appears Beamer will be adding to his staff. Yeah, I mean, you, you point to your players and you say, hey, uh, you know, Pete Limbo was great. He's going to be, obviously, Wes, extremely hard to replace in so many different ways, right? But um, you do need a special teams coach if you're Shane Beamer. And if you're not coaching it yourself, splitting it amongst the staff, which I don't think we anticipated he was going to do that, and you hire a replacement, it needs to be someone impressive, right? That This is something – you've kind of built your program identity around special teams. Uh, with the way that they structured it Be – Beamer mentioned, Wes, this weekend that, like, man, I don't know if, if anybody – even under his dad, Frank Beamer, the special teams did not get as much meeting time, even that much emphasis. And so if he was going to go this route, you expected he was probably going to go after somebody pretty impressive with, as you said, a really good resume. And that's what Joe D brings. You know, this is a guy that has spent his entire career, save for one year in the NFL. He was uh, I think his technical title, special assistant to the head coach for Steve Sarkeesian at Texas, but um, was a guy that Sark said would would be helping with the special teams. Other than that, he's been in the NFL for his entire career coordinating special teams. And so when Shane Beamer can officially introduce him to players and players can kind of Google him and look up his resume, this is a guy that's been at the highest level of football for a very long time. And so that's that's definitely a, a strong resume, as you said, Wes. And a guy that, um, you know, is familiar with the South Carolina program from the past, was a clinic speaker this last spring, and uh, someone that Shane Beamer has has obviously known about for quite some time. Yeah, no doubt, man. And I, I think even, even with the great hire, you're not going to replace a Pete Limbo, right, in terms of somebody coming in – they, they can't try to be Pete Limbo. they got to be themselves, just like Pete Limbo could only be Pete Limbo. He couldn't try to um, be Frank Beamer or, or be Shane Beamer or be whoever. Everybody's going to have their own unique approach. And so will it be different? Will there be adjustments for everybody involved? Of, of course, that is that is part of life, whether you're talking about regular old jobs and, and managers changing or whether you're talking about SEC big boy football and, and coaches changing. So it, it'll be investment for everybody. But I, I do think in terms of just hiring someone, at least on the special teams piece, we'll, we'll see if they give Jody that associate head coach role as well. But on the special teams piece, you're talking about somebody who, I mean, dude, if you've done it at the NFL level for 30 years, you you've done some things right, and you you have a level of respect in that league that I, I think will will say a lot. If I if I'm a recruit, which you know I, I think that that's really the the one about this hire, just because he's not been an on field assistant 
in you know in the co- at the college level as a recruiter, it's all right. Well, can he recruit? To me, as long as he's willing to work at it, as long as he's willing to just put some energy into it, I don't really even know, Chris, if that's a huge deal for a special teams coordinator. Mm-hmm. Have an area. He'll be expected to recruit it. He'll be expected to what? Handle his kickers, his punters, his snappers. Other than that, you know, I, I look at I look at a coach, take care of your room. So, yes, there's a team recruiting aspect. Yes, there's a, you know, hey, you got to be on the road like everybody else. You got to go to your area and yourself, recruit some kids, get the feeling. Most of your rec- Hey, receiver, you got to take care of the receiver's room. Running backs coach, you take care of the running backs room. To me, this is kind of like what we've talked about before. There are certain positions where the recruiting aspect, it's always important, but the recruiting aspect comes second or third or, or just way down the line for me. Can you coach special teams is what you need from this spot. And for South Carolina, they've put such an emphasis on it, Chris, that they're trying to win the margins by being great on special teams. And so to me, finding guys who could be that, who could do that, not a lot of them out there. So I, I think the recruiting part, you put that to the side and, and is on other things here. Yeah, I agree with you. It, you know, when you look at like look at Pete Limbo, for instance, he brought, as we've said often here, kind of that head coaching mentality to the program, you know, it, it here's press conferences. He talks like a head coach and, and not surprisingly, right. This guy's he was been a head coach three times before he got to South Carolina. Now he's a head coach again at Buffalo. And with limbo, you didn't look at Pete limbo and go, man, like this guy's going to come into South Carolina and be a stud recruiter, like a one-on-one stud recruiter. You said he's going to be a great special teams coach. And what else is he going to do for you in recruiting? He's going to bring you, some connections to schools. Limbo was a guy from New York, so he got South Carolina in at some schools up there, up north, Philly, had some ties up there, would get South Carolina involved with some guys. Now, Joe D has obviously not been a college coach, on-field assistant. He's just an NFL guy, but he'll he'll have some ties, right? He'll have, hey, I coached this guy in the NFL in – 2000 and now he's a high school coach somewhere right he's got a kid we'll go recruit that school like you said taking care of the position kickers punters snappers a lot of that's going to be the walk-on route so a lot of that's going to be looking at guys on film having guys in camp who can we get in there and then working connections so uh, you know Beamer talked about that a little bit this weekend with you know it is an unknown like you said Wes when you're bringing in a guy who hasn't done it but it's a different situation right than bringing in a Sterling Lucas who also has only really been an on-field coach at the NFL level, will this guy be able to recruit? And Lucas has checked that box in a big way, but it's not as it's not as pivotal that Joe D be some great recruiter one-on-one because of the position and because of the job that he has at USC. Yeah, Sterling Lucas comes in, and, and yeah, it's an unknown, but you're expecting him to go fill out the, the edges room, you know, and he's he's certainly done that, so – uh, it, it's just different. Every single position, every single coach, uh, as far as a positional uh, situation goes, there are different qualities, I think, that have to be in place. For special teams, I mean, it, it truly is a third of the game in that it doesn't always get treated that way. But schemes, as far as kickoffs, kickoff returns, punt, punt returns, even not even getting into what everybody loves and what South Carolina made a living on was was all these fakes. But there are different sort of philosophies and and things that you need to have a deep knowledge of, I feel like, to where how many times did it feel like Pete Limbo just saw some little detail that helped spur South Carolina to to block a punt or to create an advantage and stuff like that. So that that – that aspect is going to be very hard to replace, even for a guy with 30 years of experience in the NFL. But I think in terms of, hey, this guy has seen it all, you know, that that's going to go a long way. And from what I've heard early on, man, 
just a high energy teacher of the game. Like th this is going to be one of those guys that if you get him out there, you know, I've, I've been watching some of his videos actually since last week. Um, the, the video crew may have to bleep out a couple of um, his, uh, his segments, you know, bleep out his bit because he's just going to be out there. Um, you know what to the wall, basically ready to roll and just brings the energy on a day-to-day -day basis. Kind of, I said this earlier on the radio, special teams coach, a little bit like a strength coach. You got to be a little bit crazy. Like you got to have a little bit of that um, just out there, outside the box approach in terms of connecting with your guys. And you want the guys that are willing to run down there at full speed on a kickoff and, and try to hammer somebody. And so I, I think Joe D has brought that energy everywhere he's been in the NFL from what I've read. And we'll obviously try to bring that to South Carolina. Well, uh, uh, here's another thing, Wes. Um, you know how last year it was always, uh, not just last year, the year before as well, Kai Kroger, all the talk about the fakes, right? And obviously when you have guys like Kai Kroger, Hunter Rogers, former high school wide receiver, who's their snapper, that helps you, right? But Pete Limbo, like you said, man, was so good. How many times did they run some type of fake and exactly what you said, Beamer or Limbo talking about it? after the game or the following Tuesday press conference. It's like, well, we saw this on film. You know, we saw a look on film that we liked, and we knew if we got that look, we would, hey, this would be a good spot to call it. I think Gamecock fans are going to be happy to know that that Joe D. Camillus is a big fan of fakes as well. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to go in every week and call a fake. You know, I, I don't know. But he has – uh, you know, Pete Limbo used the word library. He says menu. And so um, if he if he has guys that he feels like can execute him, he's not afraid to call him. We know Shane Beamer, a fan of being aggressive on special teams, lining up and going for two, even if the situation, quote unquote, does not necessarily call for it. He'll do those things. And so I think that's probably, Wes, again, we go back to program identity. Part of your program identity is being really good on special teams. Part of that is, can we steal a possession? Do I have a, can I hire a special teams coach that believes in those same things, believes in being aggressive? And I think that's also what he has in Joe D. Camillus as well. There's plenty of evidence on that, of that throughout his NFL career as well. Yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, two Super Bowl championships and um, a, a guy who has really had, had a lot of success at, at multiple places. And from what I've heard, talking to at least one person who's kind of tied in there at Texas, man, that was not a position in title only at Texas this past year. Like, he was very involved. Um, I'm actually trying to find out how involved he was in the special teams. A big part of his role was trying to be right there in game situations near Sark for those – decisions that you're having to make about those very things. You're like, when, when do you go for it on fourth down? When do you go for two um, time management situations and, and stuff like that? What was heavily in that, like it wasn't just one of those things where, you know, sometimes guys are hired and it's kind of just the title only from what I understand was not the case for him at Texas. And I, I'm, I'm very curious to see what the route is for Shane Beamer is the associate head coach or assistant head coach, like, you know, the, the top assistant who's right there. That was such a big role for Pete Limbo. I, yeah. I dare say, Chris, that role for him, I don't want to say more important because he brought so much teams, but was just as important for South Carolina as his special teams coordinator title was. So I, I'm curious to see who – gets that title moving forward. Well, I think, well, she look at the the guys that Beamer's brought in this offseason, right? And and so you've got Joe D, who's going to bring that pro perspective, a ton of experience. Um, you've got James Coley, who has coached for many years in college under a bunch of different personalities. He's been a play caller. 
He's been a position coach. He's been a really good recruiter. You've got Markel Blackwell, who, you know, also has a lot of different experiences. Former high school head coach, been a coordinator, played quarterback, running backs coach at several different schools under several different guys. And so what I think you have is a lot of experience that he's brought in and some different types of personalities. And that may end up being helpful just to the whole team picture to get some get some more voices that have a lot of experience. And I think you're right. Limbo, you know, Shane Beamer's not been shy in the past about saying publicly, hey, you know, I I asked this, even if he doesn't say who the coach is, I reached out to some coaches I know, some head coaches I know, and I asked them about this particular thing. How do you handle this particular situation? Limbo was great for that. But I feel like Beamer has some guys on staff that, yeah, James Coley, Mark Well, Blackwell, they haven't been – Joe D, they haven't been college head coaches, but they do have a lot of, I think, really relevant experience that maybe he can lean on in some certain areas. Yeah, man. And I, I think th the one reason I thought Beamer might even be willing to go younger on this hire and potentially go hire a Stanton Weber was because of the experience he in with those last two hires. And I, I think Be Beamer's talked about this too, man, but I, I think this is absolutely true. You need you need a mix uh, on your, your staff. And you need you need the young guys to keep the to keep the older guys young. You know what I'm saying? And you need the old guys to ground the younger guys and to provide that type of knowledge that can only be experienced. Mm -hmm. And um, you need the young guys to be willing to learn from the older guys and not feel like they have all the answers. And you need the old guys to be willing to impart some of that knowledge on, on your young guys. And I feel like if you have an entire staff of just veterans, a lot of them sometimes are going to be stuck in their ways and you're not going to have new ideas in the room. Your young guys, if you have too many of them, you're going to connect with young people better as act of life. But maybe there's going to be times where you see some, you see a situation you've never seen before. I mean, we've all in business or in life been in a situation and been like, how do I handle this? Well, if you're a veteran or you have veterans on a the staff, they're going to be like, oh, dude, we had this situation five years ago when I was here. Here's what we did. It worked. Or here's what we did, and it didn't work. And so I think you have to have that balance, and, and South Carolina has kept with that balance. I think they've got maybe a little bit more experienced with this latest round of hires. But, you know, they, as we reported, um, they, they were heavily involved with the co-offensive coordinator and running backs coach at Liberty. He was a younger guy, so it didn't necessarily have to play out that way with all three of these hirings. But I think certainly when you lose a guy with Limbo's experience, you, you're you going to have to fill it somewhere, you know? And so one thing I don't think necessarily will be able to bring at this point that Limbo had was the experience as a college head coach. I, I think for Beamer – now, he's got three years under his belt now. But for Beamer, just being a first-year head coach when he first got the job, it was huge to have somebody like Limbo to lean on for things such as that. Absolutely huge. And you're, you're right. You know, Joe D is going to be a different type of guy than Limbo and, and a different background, and he'll bring different things to the table. There, there may be some things he doesn't bring as much of, like that college head coach experience. Maybe he could bring more, you know, in some areas. We'll we'll see. But but definitely a different thing, Wes, when you're looking at you – know, you're kind of looking at the profile of, hey, what did South Carolina need in a running backs coach? And I think the top thing that most people would point to, and it's probably accurate, is, hey, man, if you're a running backs coach, you got to be able to go out and acquire talent. Like that, that's, that's kind of your number one thing as a running backs coach, right? You obviously need to be a teacher and – you got to be able to control your room and connect with kids. But if you don't acquire talent as a running backs coach, 
you're not going to end up looking like a very good running backs coach. And, and so that's the top thing. Special teams coach, it's pretty evident what Beamer went with here is let's lean on X's and O's because that that is what got you here. That's that's why they've been so good on special teams under Pete Limbo is because from an X's and O's standpoint, in almost every game they played, you felt like, hey, they have – when it comes to special teams, they got the advantage because they have really good specialists, yes, but from a schematic standpoint – they're going to be better than most teams that they play. And a lot of times it played out that way. So clearly this was a move where he, he went heavy Beamer did on let's lean into X's and O's and let's try to go out there and be really good on special teams again. Yeah. So Beamer could not speak on the hire quite yet on Saturday, but um, was sort of asked in hypotheticals and Chris, didn't he use the phrase grand slam hire? Yeah. I think he did. So uh, shows you what he thinks of this. They'll um, they'll be uh, looking to make that official later on. We're, we're recording this and going live at two twenty five right now. BOT meeting at about five o'clock here on Monday. So uh, I guess barring any last second hiccups, that's expected to be finalized, and uh, and South Carolina will be able to get moving with that. And um, for the most part, right now though, the focus other than this move. Which, by the way, before I move on, Chris, you got anything else to add on Joe D? No, you can move on, man. Uh, yeah, so moving on. Lots of recruiting going on right now. Junior days over the weekend. Staff back on the road recruiting as well. And um, also final rankings are out for own 3 2024 class. This is like after senior seasons, after all-star games have taken place. And, you know, a, a situation where – the uh, the rankings are now just fine. I always think it's important to mention first and foremost, and I I don't know the best way that we as an organization can frame this up, but I, I think it always gets a little bit lost in translation. You have own three rankings, which is what came out today. And that is the own three rankings team, our Cody Belair, I don't know Cody quite as well. We know Charles very well. Obviously, he's on the show quite a bit. Going to effort getting Charles on the show here soon. But on three rankings, that is that team and their rankings, and it doesn't. it's not been affected by any other organization. That's what came out today. The on three industry ranking is – Kind of a a way to try and give you, this is how the industry feels. And it is a weighted average that includes, it does include on three, but also includes 24-7 sports, also includes rivals, also includes ESPN. So that's always, I think, an important distinction, Chris, that I think sometimes just gets lost. Yes. Good, good explanation there, Wes. If I did not know that already, great explanation. So... So two five stars still for South Carolina within those on three rankings. Uh, Josiah Thompson stays a five star. Dylan Stewart stays a five star. And then Fred Johnson, another early enrollee from this class, moves up to four star status. Wes, I think well deserved. I, I think I didn't know that that would happen for sure, but when people asked inevitably, hey, hey, what three stars do you think have a chance to move up or, or which guys can move up? He was kind of the guy I really pointed to because, you know, his, here's a guy that's 6'3", 225. He can really, really run. Um, we saw him in camp last summer. He was really good in that setting. And then this is a guy that ended up being a state champion uh, for his high school team in Virginia at Maury. Had a great year for them, former high school wide receiver. So a, a big-time athlete. Again, you, you got to temper expectations. Sometimes we see four stars, we see five stars. I've got to be an All-American as a freshman. Don't know that we necessarily need to expect that from Brad Johnson, but um, somebody that moved up in the rankings, and I, I think Wes well-deserved on that front. Yeah, man, no doubt. And um, so – I, I think in terms of 
the other services, I think they've final have they all finalized their rankings for now? I couldn't say that for sure. I, I wanna say that 24-7 and rivals have, but I'm not totally sure. I know they both released updates. I would think that'd probably be the last round, and I'm gonna be honest, I have no clue on ESPN. No clue. I don't know what their calendar looks like. Yes. I think everybody kind of which means the the problem for fans trying to follow this stuff too, dude, is it's like it, it all changed quickly. Um that the then it gets updated. We keep uh we keep losing Wes here on the mute. Yeah, basically I think you were trying to say the way that the rankings work. You were cutting out a little bit on me too. But basically, you know, they'll, they'll get updated at different times throughout the year. And what, here's one, here's another common question while we're doing some FAQs. You know, a lot of times the thing I really like about on threes rankings, and I'm not throwing shade at anybody else's rankings, right? I, I can't say that I know how any of the service does them. I've never been in any of their rankings meetings, et cetera. But one thing that that we did we do see from on three is is Charles in particular and Cody Belair on Twitter, you know, they put out data on the guys. And so, you know, you look at Dylan Stewart, you look at Josiah Thompson, they're putting out data on the guys as far as, you know, here's their measurables, right? Here's what they did in high school. There's a you might not agree with the ranking. Maybe you say, ah, there's no way that there's, you know, 15 there's no way that there's 15 guys ahead of this particular guy. And, and most of the time when people said that, that they've never in their life, you know, seen any of these other players. Um, but anyway, I digress. You know, they put out all the data on these guys and, and kind of say, Hey, here's, here's his wingspan. Here's some of his measurables. Here's what we saw in camp. And they go and see guys in camp as much as possible. Charles, I think does a really, really good job. Uh, with that in particular. So hopefully Wes will be able to get him on here soon and kind of, cause I know he saw Josiah at the, at the army game and uh, saw Dylan Stewart and under armor. And I'm really curious to see what, what did he, what did he think about Fred Johnson during his senior year? Why did he kind of, you know, move up that high and get some thoughts from Charles on that as well? Yeah. Fred, a guy who already had moved up in, um, some of the other rankings, and then now I, I believe was already he was four star on on the on three industry ranking already because that was kind of being pushed up by other rankings, and now also a four star on on three. And man, they're they're incredibly high on Matthew Fuller as well. Fuller is believe it or not actually like the third highest rated prospect in this class by on three, which originally when he committed depending on which rankings you looked at. He was one of the lower guys, I, I think, in this class. But this is, once again, if you've noticed, man, when Charles Power, like, puts his name on a guy, like, he puts his stamp on a guy, it, at least at South Carolina, these guys have tended to work out. I remember Nicky Mawori, you know, he was a four-star by Charles when he really wasn't getting much love from, from probably anywhere else at the beginning. and. Lenore Sellers, he had as a four-star. Uh, let's see, there was somebody else. I can't remember. There's another guy he was very, very high on. But um, And even in this class, he was higher on Josiah and Dylan Stewart really before some of the other ranking services agreed with him. And with Fuller, we've just seen him steadily move up. And is currently – now, if you look at the on three industry ranking, he's still kind of more middle of the pack. Yeah, Trey, good call. Kilgore. Um, he was pretty high on Kilgore, but I'll be curious to see Fuller, not a guy that will be here for spring, so we won't find out here soon, but I will be very curious to see, um, you know, what Fuller looks like as a freshman at South Carolina. Yeah, that that's one. Just a few guys, Wes, that were not able to enroll from that freshman class. Fuller's one. 
And you remember, man, Charles liked Fuller. That, that's kind of another one of these misconceptions and rankings. That guy's three star. Must not think he's very good, right? I mean, a, a three star high school prospect is someone that analysts generally look at and say, hey, this guy has some potential to be really good in college and he has some pro potential. So if you're told you can be a pro player in a sport, potentially, that's not bad. It's not a negative to be a three star guy, right? Um, you're getting a scholarship to an SEC school. You've got those offers. You're a three-star type of guy. That can be really, really good. But the thing that Charles told us about Matt Fuller, West was, hey, I want to see those yards per carry go up a little bit. Well, he had another huge senior year. He was able to do that. And so, man, I didn't even realize he was the third highest rated guy in the class. But um, someone that ended up doing exactly what they wanted to see on the field – and I, I feel like he's almost gotten lost a little bit. For all the talk about running back recruiting and landing some talents there, they went out and got Matt Fuller. And he's he's still, even though he's a highly ranked guy, he's a guy that South Carolina had to hold on to at the end. He's still flown a little bit under the radar. And so really curious to get a look at him, even though it's going to be, you know, preseason before we get a chance to do that. Yeah, no doubt, man. It, it is crazy how that room one of the biggest question marks on the entire roster has been completely flipped and so you know we talked about if you're Markwell Blackwell like you you've walked into a pretty good situation all things considered in terms of the guys that are first and then adding a young guy like Matt Fuller into the mix as well um I, by the way I'm I've ditched the actual microphone so if I sound a little bit less quality and audio we're just going to go off the laptop because that mic keeps disconnecting which is why that's happening and um we'll just we'll just roll with it but um let's see let's let's talk a little basketball then and then we'll close it out with a little recruiting and then we'll get out of here but both teams winning over the weekend women's basketball our business kind of a like i don't know if you got game yesterday chris but i was going to uh two screens watching both the NFL and watching the women's basketball, kind of a business-like um, win for them. Vandy, I, I didn't realize this. Vandy women's basketball team this year, pretty solid. Like they they were game. They did not back down. I, I thought they came in, hit some shots early, hung around, and you really had both men's team and women's team were dealing with kind of that. You had a big emotional win in your previous game. How can you respond to it? And we'll start with the women, then we'll get into the men. Um, I, I thought they just responded, dude, did their thing. You're going to get a balanced attack from, from this program. You never know who the three or four that are going to take over are going to be. But, man, Cardoso, probably one of her better outings of her career on Sunday. No, you're exactly right. I, that, you actually kind of took the words out of my mouth. That was the exact point I was going to make that, like, look, it you don't know who it's going to be with women's basketball. You can have your suspicions uh, because they can throw so many different ones at you. Um, you. You know, you think back to the LSU game. Cardoso doesn't do much for a while. Like, she's not getting touches, and then, boom, she explodes later in the game. You put in Malaysia Fulwiley, a freshman, in that LSU game. All of a sudden, she's making a couple of really big plays. Um, Pow Pow can, you know, always explode with a couple of threes. And so you look at that Vandy game, I, I think balanced attack, it, it, great game for Cardoso. And really, you can just you can just get attacked from so many different ways with this team. And it, it's always funny, Wes. Just, it shows you how good they are. You can be following along with the game, and you're going, man, they're only winning by 10? This is tough, you know? And you just expect with the women, they can play poorly in a game and win by 30 points, and it's just no problem. That's how deep they are. So it, it was definitely, you know, like, I think you made another great point, a bunch of good points there at once, man. It, it is easy sometimes for there to be these letdown type games. That was a big emotional win at LSU. Um, Vandy done a, yeah, Shea Ralph, great point by SC Scout guy. She knows about building a program right and, and Vanderbilt in terms of women's basketball probably a tougher job than some um 
but a, a well-coached team, a pretty good team, and South Carolina was able to take business, take care of business again under Don Staley. And uh, I mean, credit where it's due, like you said, man, that Vandy team, pretty, uh, pretty solid. Didn't seem deterred by Carolina. Like they, they kind of came in and, and did their thing. And it, it is, it is kind of hilarious the different feel in any other basketball game, like in the history of basketball. If a team is winning by 12, you're like, all right, 12 point lead. That's a, that's a pretty deep. It's not, a lead that could never be um, relinquished. But if your team's up by 12, you're like, all right, we're, we're in control. And so uh, it, when, when Carolina women are up by 12, you're like, are they okay? What's going on? So it's just a different, it's insane. I mean, it, it speaks to, it speaks to what they've built. It speaks to what Don Staley has built, that the expectations are freaking high, but that's, I mean, that's where, um, and it, it is definitely a great crowd. I thought that, uh, I thought it was another great crowd for the men on Saturday as well, coming off the bonkers crowd against Kentucky. And so that to me, other example on Saturday of that, this is a pretty veteran team. Like they, much like their coach, they just kind of stay right here. Right. And, and we saw we saw Tuesday. That doesn't mean play the moment. Like they were having a blast. They were feeding off the energy of that crowd on Tuesday. However, they, I believe, are a group that knows how to not get too down, not get too up from a big picture standpoint. And we saw that by them sort of uh, just taking care of business as well against a Missouri team that has struggled to find wins. Lately. But is gonna fight you, is not gonna sell, and uh, has been able to get into some close games. Yeah, that we I was talking about that with some people after watching Missouri. You know, I've only watched not a Missouri basketball expert, I've watched them a couple times against South Carolina, and they're one of those teams you look at and you go, They're a bad team, but they're not bad. Like their record says they're bad because they're 0 and 7 in conference, they haven't found a win. I think they're 0 and 7, uh, yet. They're they're scrappy. They they give you they gave South Carolina two good games. One of them in overtime on the road, obviously. But it was a big win, West, because of I think the reason you outlined earlier, South Carolina big emotional upset win at home over Kentucky. Now you need to go and hold serve. Yeah, it's great to beat a top ten team. Those are resume building wins. But what you don't want to do is have a resume building win and then wipe it out by losing a game like that. And and I think this is a difference with this team. Yeah, their non-conference strength of schedule was not top 25, right? But they took care of business. And you look at this team for South Carolina that's tracking very well to make postseason play, and you compare it to some of the other teams in the past, those other teams, what they would frequently have was a couple at least, what the heck was that, losses. And this South Carolina team so far does not have that. They lost to a good Clemson team on the road. They, the, the, the kind of the what the heck game was, I guess you could say that Georgia game, Wes, at home, because you easily could have won that. That's not a bad Georgia team. And then you lost to an Alabama team on the road and didn't play very well. And that team's currently number one in the SEC. So you don't have that bad loss, quote unquote, right now. And if you're South Carolina, that's really what you wanted to avoid. That's why. With the non-conference you had, you needed to get out of it pretty much unscathed, and they were able to do that. But they're also, at the same time, making some noise in conference. So doesn't get any easier starting with tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, with Tennessee, obviously. That's going to be a tough one. Um, but th this is a team that did very well to hold serve, winning those types of games, you know, at Missouri, at home against Missouri. Those ones you got to win. For sure, man. Um, all right, before we move any further, going to tell you about our friend Andy Ludicky at My Perfect Franchise. He can help you find your perfect franchise by going to myperfectfranchise.net or contacting Andy multiple ways here, Andy at myperfectfranchise.net, or just give him a call, shoot him a text, 404-973-9901. Andy, um, essentially, call a guy's or a franchise consultant. And what he does is he helps 
guys find people that also fit um, their skill set, financial requirements, time to commit, and more, where he kind of matches the two together. So if uh, if you are a person wanting to diversify or build wealth, a legacy, maybe you want to either A, leave your or looking for a hustle that could help you build more money, build more wealth on the side. Um, you speak with Andy, you tell him what your needs are, what your wants are, then he's going to match you up with our franchise that is looking for people the same needs and wants uh, the best. His services are 100% free. He's here to help you if you have any questions about business ownership. And uh, Andy is a business owner as well himself. So give Andy a call today, 404-973-9901. Had a great call with him a couple weeks ago. We certainly appreciate him being a sponsor here on the show. Let's uh, talk a little bit of recruiting before we get out of here, Chris. and. Gamecocks, another junior day over the weekend, and a little bit of an in-state flair, as well as some highly recruited out-of-state guys in as well. Yeah, Wes, some some kind of a theme here, some good receivers in-state for the next couple cycles, right? You look at Malik Clark out of Rock Hill, big rangy kid who can run from 2025. He was on campus last week, but some good in-state talent uh, from the 2026 class on campus this week, uh, you got Jordan Gidron from Ridgeview, got Donovan Murph um, out of Irmo, and some other underclassmen as well. But uh, of course, South Carolina's lone 2025 commitment is Jaden Sellers, brother of Lenoris Sellers. He was uh, on campus as well. Uh, yeah, Corbin Fordham, a 2026 tight end, former high school teammate of Connor Cox. He's out of Florida, uh, but he was on campus as well. So Couple junior days in a row where South Carolina was able to get some, you know, priority targets on campus. Jamel Housie, by the way, out of Newberry from the 2026 class as well. John T. Gilbert, who's been here. Wes, I think we were trying to come up with the number earlier. You said about 10 times on campus. I don't know if that was a guess or that, that's probably about right. Four star guy out of Georgia. He's been on campus a bunch. Anthony Addison out of Sumter, a 2025 edge at South Carolina's had in camp and offered earlier this year. So uh, AJ Brand out of Irmo, bunch of different guys. And we got, you know, full list of the guys that were on campus. Jalen Gilchrist is probably somebody I should mention too, the offensive lineman from Virginia. So coaches still out on the road this week, um, hosted targets the past couple of junior days. This 2025 class, Wes, a little bit more slower, slower developing, I think in terms of early momentum than 2024, but there's more than one way to, to build a class, right? Uh, so we'll see how it goes, but definitely some priority targets on campus the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I feel like it is starting to come together a little bit, and, and the 2026 class already, I, I think, in-state sort of local guys that they like starting to kind of, I don't, I don't want to say take shape, but at least – their top targets, that that aspect of it is already starting to kind of take shape. And it feels like 26 may be a little bit deeper in the state of South Carolina. Five, maybe that doesn't end up being the case, but early on, um, there are some guys to, to really like in the state of South Carolina for that class and that we'll be tracking very closely, I, I feel like, for the next couple of years. Yeah, Jalen Gilchrist, I, I was told visit went great have not uh, been able to catch up with him specifically, uh, talk briefly with somebody who who knows him, and they said it was another great visit for them. I, Dude, I can't say that I have this completely sourced at this point, but there, there are some good vibes here for South Carolina. Like I, I feel like the number of visits that Jalen Gilchrist has taken to South Carolina, plus the feedback we get after every visit, I'm not predict he's going to South Carolina, yet, but I'm getting Gamecock vibes here. So we'll see if they can get that from where it is now, kind of to the finish line. But but I think they're in a good place here. And not a guy that was on campus this weekend, but was on campus this month. Ryan, the four-star quarterback. I'm getting Gamecock vibes there too, man. I feel like South Carolina just prioritizing him so much, I think has gone a long way 
someone who understands the process and has been very deliberate in the process and it's kind of just walked through a step-by-step um sort of approach to the process and and that one seems less like an sec battle right where georgia got into the mix a little bit lately it seemed like a lot of florida and south carolina florida we were theorizing earlier this morning together that they might have slipped some um we saw florida offered another 2025 quarterback recently out of pennsylvania you're kind of going hmm, that's kind of odd a little weird Let's see if he ends up taking that February 3rd visit to Florida as planned. But the next step for Montgomery West has been on campus several times. The staff's been out on the road to see him. He's got to decide, hey, do I shut this thing down early and commit somewhere? Not necessarily just to South Carolina, right? But commit somewhere. Do I prolong this thing? Wes, would it be good news if we get some info in the next few days that, yeah, I think Montgomery's going to go ahead and decide soon. That might be good news for the Gamecocks, given the way this one's gone lately. No, I, I think it definitely would be. And he's someone that Dow Loggins supposed to is expected back by there today as well. And so South Carolina, you know, really it, it seems prioritized him for a long time now, and that has gone a long way with him. I uh, I, I think the not to read too much in the Florida offer to someone else, but I, I do think we can read a little bit into that. And even some of the guys covering Florida on on three were kind of reading into that. So I, I kind of take their I take their read on that to be meaningful. Craig asking us in the chat, what are they recruiting AJ Brand as? And yeah, he he's a quarterback, but being recruited more as a defensive back at South Carolina. Also a heck of a basketball player, too, apparently. Chris, you've you've watched him play basketball? Yeah, just a really good athlete. You know, he uh high school quarterback for Irma. They had a great year. His dad, eight his dad, Aaron Brand's the coach there. And, you know, South Carolina had Irmo in seven on seven this past year. They really like him as a DB, played DB and quarterback for them in seven on seven. Just a great kid, good athlete, really good competitor, coach's kid. So maybe it ends up being Wes, a guy like a DQ Smith, right, who can make that transition from quarterback, and so many others too, um, who can make that transition from quarterback to DB. So I think South Carolina is in a good spot uh, with A.J. Brand as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, Anthony Addison, in-state Ed from Sumter, where he was on camp, I would say great early shape with him too and wanted one to keep it on. A lot of these guys, interestingly enough, going to Tennessee this weekend. So something to keep an eye on. I was chatting with a couple of these guys, getting reactions, and several said, I said, what, what's your next visit? Several said Tennessee. Okay. So um, we'll be a little Palmetto State flair in Knoxville this coming weekend, it appears. Not a big deal, but just something to maybe keep an eye on there in terms of upcoming visits for these guys. Uh, let's see. What else do we? Anybody else we want to hit on right now before we get out of here, Chris? Nobody else really comes to mind right now. I think we hit on the main ones. Of course, you're going to say, ah, oh, you left out so-and-so. Yeah, a couple of a couple of edge guys that were worth mentioning, but I, I really, Chris, I feel like we need to get a little feedback on um, if they all made it in and – what like I, I haven't really just heard enough to to speak on it. Do we do we know if Isaiah made it into Columbia? Isaiah Gibson? Yes, he did. That's good enough that I've heard. Still still gathering there, but yes, he did make it in. Had a good abbreviated trip because of his basketball schedule, but it was iffy as to whether or not he'd even make it in, and he did. So they made that happen. But you know, online seems like Georgia. Is is an early, but uh, Sterling Lucas doing his thing. I, I mean, he's been a priority guy for for a while now. Somebody to keep an eye on, and a big time prospect, and a big time target for South Carolina. Chris, why don't you tell everybody for me how you're overcoming your tax anxiety, and that you actually, frankly, have no tax anxiety. Yeah, at this that, point. I was gonna say, you know, I'm I'm past it, Wes. There, there's been times in my life where I've had tax anxiety. Nowadays, I walk around with just none. I just feel great. 
don't have to struggle with it at all. Because of my friend Larry at Liberty Tax, we have a meeting booked with him literally, uh, I think, about a week or about eight days from today. So we'll be meeting with the team at Liberty Tax and Larry, 803 462 If you do have some tax anxiety, you don't have anybody to file your taxes, don't have time, don't have knowledge. It's an important thing, guys and girls. So make sure that you get somebody who knows what he or she is doing. And the team at Liberty Tax certainly does. Larry has a lot of experience. Great guy, great supporter of the program as well. It's Liberty Tax, 803-462-5576. And tell them Chris and Wes sent you over. No doubt. I appreciate all of our greats. Appreciate Clint Hammond, Andy Ludicky. Anybody who's ever supported us, whether you still are or not, we certainly appreciate you. I think that's going to do it for today. You've got to get back to that Gamecock Central content. Come check us out. Come hang out. If you're not a subscriber, I mean, we'll forgive you, but we'd love for you to come check us out. Use code SCAR1, code SCAR1 to get $1, two months for $1, GamecockCentral.com. For Chris, I'm Wes. Uh, Mike will be back on, on tomorrow. Chris and I will be back on Wednesday, and they will, we will take it. Again, thanks for joining. Appreciate the support. For Chris, I'm Wes.